Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So I guess an honor, it's an honor to uh, be the first speaker in this, uh, this conference. And um, yeah, I wanna talk about uh, motivic homotopy theory without a one invariant. So this is based on joint work with Tony Anala and Ryome Iwasa. Um, yeah, so the goal is motivic homotopy without a one invariance. Um, of course, the motivation for this is that, uh, so does the mic work now, by the way? I guess so, if no one complains, uh, <laughs> I'll continue. Yeah, my motivation is of course um, that uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, cohomology theories uh, that we care about, which are not a one homotopy invariant. Um, there's a majority of them in fact. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, mention a few. So there's uh, all, the, all the cohomology theories that come from uh, non-commutative invariant like uh, algebraic K theory, but uh, so algebraic K theory does happen to be a one homotopy invariant on regular schemes, but not in general. And then you have things like topological Hochschild homology, topological cyclic homology. Uh, you also have um, things like Hermitian K theory, uh, this kind of uh, non commutative this uh, yeah, more, uh, yeah. Um, Hermitian K theory and uh, real versions of THH and all that stuff. So these are all these non-commutative things and they are uh, almost never a one homotopy invariant. And then another source of examples are anything which satisfies a tal descent and also has P torsion, yeah, where P is a residual characteristic. These things also cannot be a one invariant because any such theory which is a one invariant is automatically zero. And there's also lots of examples of this here. So, um, Things like uh, prismatic cohomology, syntomic cohomology, the RAM cohomology, um, Hodge cohomology, and so on and so forth. Yeah. These uh, are all non ey invariant things. Um, and then there's also, so recently, Eldon Elmanto and Matthew Moore have also defined motivic cohomology of uh, general base scheme somehow, which filters uh, algebraic K theory. And so these are also correspondingly uh, non ey one invariant. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so A1 invariants we don't like so much, but um, all um, known cohomology theories, they still do satisfy um, some nice properties like Nisnevich descent, for example. So descent for the Nisnevich topology. Um, they have um, P1 de-loopings. So they will be represented by P1 spectra yeah? as in stable motivic homotopy theory. Um, and um, so these are also two conditions which are part of the definition of the stable A1 homotopy category. Yeah? And then the third one would be A1 invariant. So now we don't want that. So we, we are looking for replacements of these A1 invariant conditions. Um, and uh, uh, one, one uh, further property that these series have is uh, so-called smooth blow-up excision. So this means the following. This means that whenever you have um, a, a blow-up of a smooth scheme of a, with, with a smooth center, like this, exceptional divisor. Um, where X and Z are smooth over some base, uh, then these, um, all these cohomology theories which I listed will, will take this square to a uh, Cartesian square, to a pullback square. So this is what's called smooth blow-up excision. Uh, 
So this follows from a one invariance, for example, because uh, if you have Nisnevich descent, then you can basically uh, reduce any such square to this just being the zero section in a fine space. Yeah? And then just a one invariance shows that this square becomes a pullback square for trivial reasons, yeah? because these two maps are now isomorphisms. Um, OK, and then other properties which are very similar to a one homotopy invariance are p one homotopy invariance. And uh, weighted a one homotopy invariance so I'll explain what I mean by these two things. so weighted a one homotopy invariance is actually just a special case of p one homotopy invariance um, but all known cohomology theories are p one homotopy invariant so some of the obvious thing which you would like to do is you want to do a one homotopy theory, but you want to use p one homotopy invariance instead of a one homotopy invariance. Um, well, it turns out this is not so straightforward, and um, the reason, I mean, the technical reason is there's a difference between p one and a one, which is that a one is an interval object in the sense of Marlin Vovodsky, and p one is not. And a one being an interval object means, in particular, that um, a1 itself is A1 homotopy contractible. Um, and uh, to enforce A1 homotopy invariant, you can consider a Bausch localization yeah, where you invert, um, you invert the projection of the form X times A1 to X. Yeah. So this is what one usually do in homotopy homotopy theory. And this is versus, this is versus A1 homotopy invariance, and, uh, and that's it. But for P1 homotopy invariance, you cannot do something like this, yeah, because P1 itself is not going to be P1 homotopy contractible. Uh, because anything, I mean, uh, an, any P1 homotopy is in particular an A1 homotopy. Yeah? So anything which is P1 con contractible is in particular A1 contractible. And of course, P1 is not A1 contractible. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But I will also spell it out yeah, in a second, but yeah. Um, exactly, so in fact, uh, P1 homotopy invariant, well, let me, I guess, make the definition and then I'll comment on that. Um, uh, definition, so suppose C is um, a category tensored over smooth schemes, or Z, say, and you have two morphisms, F and G, from X to Y in C. All right, then a P1 homotopy from F to G um, is a map H, P1 tensor X to Y, such that um, H, uh, if I restrict to zero, I get F, and if I restrict to one, I get G. Yeah. So of course, I mean, if you replace A1 here, you get the notion of, if you replace P1 by A1, you get the notion of A1 homotopy. Uh, let me also explain what weighted A1 homotopy is. So. Is um, it's simply a GM equivariant A1 homotopy? So it's a GM equivariant map A1 tensor X to Y uh, with the same property between F and G. <coughs> so here GM acts uh, on this A1 yeah. and nowhere else. Um, yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, yeah, the weight of this action is also not important. I mean, uh, you get the equivalent notion of, uh, you, you get the equivalent uh, homotopy classes of maps yeah, for any non-zero weight. Yeah. If the weight is zero, then of course it's just A1 invariance, but uh, it's just an A1 homotopy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so if you have a P1, if you have a, a such a weighted A1 homotopy, then you also have a P1 homotopy between the maps. Uh, because there is a, uh, there's a map from P1 to A1 mod GM, which sends 0 to 0 and 1 to 1. Yeah, so that's why it's a special case. 
okay, but now uh, the issue is, so if you try to enforce P1 homotopy invariance uh, in some category of pre-sheaves on smooth schemes, say, um, the issue is P1 homotopy invariance is not really a property of a functor. Yeah? It's more like a structure on a functor because you have to, uh, I mean, whenever you have such a P1 homotopy between two maps, then your functor has to associate an act a homotopy between the images of the two maps. Yeah? So this extra structure which you have on a functor and um, so now in the A1 case, it turns out this extra structure is uniquely determined, yeah? so it just becomes a property of being A1 homotopy invariant, which we're familiar with. But this does not work for P1. Uh, so it is not at all clear that there exists a reasonable Bowsby localization of pre sheaves uh, which enforces P1 homotopy invariance. I mean, there do exist such Bowsby localization. For example, you can you can make P1 contractible in the same way that we make A1 contractible in ordinary homotopy theory. So then certainly that's a Bowsby localization in which, uh, which enforces P1 homotopy invariance. Yeah, but it's much too strong yeah, because most of the invariants we care about do not regard P1 as being contractible. Yeah, so we don't want to do that. Um, yeah, so it's not, so this is why, why this theory is difficult and not just an obvious uh, translation of A1 homotopy theory. Yeah. And so what we do in this joint work is we propose a solution. One question. Yeah. Why can't you just invert P1 equivalences? Like map, where you have map back and then P1 homotopy both ways? Uh, yeah, this you can do, but I think it's not clear that this enforces P1 homotopy invariance. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Probably it's probably not, probably not inverting enough if you do this, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there is no, there is no action here. There's only here. Trivial action. Trivial action yeah. Trivial. <laughs> yeah. GM acts trivially on X and Y. Yeah, so that's a bit weird, but uh, <laughs> not not every A1 homotopy can be promoted with, I mean, you can you cannot always put such a GM action on it, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, our solution is, um, we're basically gonna build the category of motivic spectra using these three properties here. and nothing else. Um, and then uh, the main result is that these three properties actually imply, uh, they, these three properties together enforce P1 homotopy invariance. So I'll try to explain this. Uh, okay, so definition. Um, so motivic spectra over some base scheme S is defined as follows. So you <clears throat> start with um, pre sheaves of spectra. So on smooth S schemes. Uh, which satisfy uh, these two conditions. So Nisnevich descent and smooth drop excision. Um, and then you want to uh, make, you want to take P1 spectra. Uh, so this is a symmetric monoidal infinity category under the uh, tensor product of spectra. And um, you want to make uh, the projective line invertible. So pointed projective line. Uh, you make it invertible with respect to the symmetric monoidal structure. Uh, okay, so this is what we call motivic spectra, and the first thing you can note is if you look at the subcategory of this, um, uh, spanned by the A1 invariant things, yeah, then this is a usual A1, stable A1 homotopy category, yeah, which is usually called SH of S of Moyle and Vovatsky. 
Yeah, so we just recover this as a subcategory of A1 invariant object yeah, in these motivic spectra. Um, okay. Mm, no, uh, this. Not yet. <laughs> Okay, are there questions on this definition? So. Okay, so now let me uh, state some results which we can prove in this category. Uh, so in the infinity category MSPS, we have the following. Uh, so first we have uh, P1 homotopy invariants, but actually uh, something uh, stronger, uh, which is projective bundle homotopy invariants. Okay, this means the following. Um, so suppose E is a, a finite locally free sheaf Um, on some smooth S scheme X. Okay, and suppose that you have two uh, sections of the associated vector bundle V of E. Sections. Yeah, so of course in A1 homotopy theory, these two sections would be homotopic to one another, but here they will become homotopic after you pass to the projective bundle, yeah? Um, so, uh, so let me call J the inclusion of VE in P of E plus O, so projective completion of the vector bundle, then J composed with S, and J composed with C are homotopic in this category. Yeah. Okay, so if you take E equal to O itself, this is P1 homotopy invariance. But it's a strictly more general statement, I guess. Um, which we really need in practice. Yeah, to make use of this, we really need E to be a non-trivial bundle in examples. Yes. Yeah? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's some functor like this, which one would probably call sigma infinity or something. Or maybe sigma infinity P1. I don't know. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> This one? Oh, no, no, that, it, no. Yeah, no, it's not fully faithful. Yeah. Uh, okay, so projective under homotopy invariance, and then uh, using this, you can prove things like the following. So if you consider the infinite Grassmannian GRN, which maps to um, BGLN, so that's now the classifying stack of vector bundles of rank N. Um, uh, well, the, this, map, this map is an equivalence in the category. So, of course, it's something which is so familiar in A1 homotopy theory, but uh, we can prove it uh, using uh, these kinds of projective bundle homotopies instead. Um, okay, three, yeah, so it's a slightly more technical statement. Uh, but which is essential for the theory of oriented cohomology. So, yeah, so you can define the Tom spaces of sheaves. So I also come back to, uh, I'll come back to talk about Tom spaces in more details later. I take the Tom spaces of O1 um, on P1. And then there's two maps from P1 into this. You can take the, the zero section as zero. And then you can take a fiber of the let's 
let's say a fiber at infinity. Yeah, so whatever this sum space is, is uh, somehow a quotient of a, a projective line bundle with P1, yeah? So if this is a fiber of this projective line bundle. Um, and then um, you have that uh, S0 is minus I infinity. Yeah? So this is a computation which you can make in this infinity category, which is stable, yeah? So this makes sense. Um, Uh, yeah, so I mean, you should think of this. I mean, this is essentially a refined version of the computation that if you take the um, the Tom class of this line bundle, uh, which is some um, some cohomology class of this Tom space, and you put it back along the zero section to get a class on P1, then you get minus um, you get minus the first turn class of this thing, and not the first turn class itself. Yeah. So this minus sign is this one here. So it's really essential. Yeah, this is what I mean by the notation. So I mean the class frame stack. So this is BGLN in the Zariski topology, at least. Yeah. No, no, I just mean uh, I, I regard it I take the suspension spectrum in there, yeah, of these things. Oh, so yeah. it doesn't represent the functor, or it does represent the functor, or you don't know? No, no, it doesn't represent. I mean, this is like an unstable thing, a vector bundle. Yeah. You don't expect those to be represented in this yeah. P1 stable category. No, it's not. these are not represented things. They are just, okay. they are implicit. I, I move everything to this category implicitly yeah, by a suspension functor. And on the left, maybe you said there's some sort of co-limit of Cosmanians, or? Exactly. So this one is collimate n goes to infinity of uh, k goes to infinity of Grassmannians of of n planes in, uh, uh, in a to the k. Uh, okay, and the last uh, result I want to mention here is the Bass fundamental theorem. So, uh, well, this usually refers to a theorem in algebraic K theory, which tells you about the algebraic K theory of GM. Uh, so, this is kind of a generalization of this theorem, which tells us what GM looks like in this category. And it looks as follows. So this is now, everything here is going to be pointed. So this is like a pointed GM, and which I view in this category. And it's a desuspension of pointed P1. So in A1 homotopy theory, you just have this. Yeah? GM is desuspension of P1. Um, in particular, GM is an invertible object. But in this theory, GM is not an invertible object. So this one is invertible. But then you also have two sum ends of A1. Yeah. So this is what GM looks like. OK. Uh, OK, let me say something about these thumb spaces now. So suppose X is a smooth scheme, and I have E, which is a finite locally free sheaf on X. Um, then we define the Tom space of E to be so you take the projective bundle of E plus O, and then you collapse the hyperplane at infinity. Um, and uh, yeah, let me just mention, so in A1 homotopy theory, one knows that um, there's lots of other way to, equivalent way of writing this thumb space. And in particular, I can write it 
starting with the vector bundle V of E and then uh, collapsing the complement of the zero section. Yeah, but I mean, in, in our non-A1 invariant theory, then these are not the same. Yeah? Um, yeah, this one is going to be bigger in some sense. I mean, you can, you can work out what it is using this kind of thing. Um, yeah, now this is now the correct definition of the Tom space. And somehow the, one of the key technical results in our paper is the, the following that um, we can promote. Uh, the assignment to the functor, which sends E to this thumb space of E, and maybe now let me just do it over the, over the base S itself. We can promote this to a symmetric monoidal functor. from uh, the K-theory space of S to MSP, to motivic spectra. So in particular, I mean, a very concrete uh, assertion contained here is that you take the Tom space of the direct sum of two things, yeah, then it's going to be that tensor product of the Tom spaces. Uh, yeah, but this is, this is uh, I mean, this is essentially the statement, but this is a more refined version. Cool. Um, Uh, yes, these ones, uh, yeah, these some spaces of S, they, they are all invertible, yeah. This is true. I mean, which is how you get a map out of key theory, so really you first get a symmetric monoidal functor from the groupoid of these uh, finite locally free sheaves to MSP, but because these are invertible, it will factor through key theory. That's how this works. Uh, but let me just give a basic example here. So, um, particularly if I just take E is equal to O, yeah, then um, Tom space of O is P1 with, I mean, it's pointed P1, pointed at infinity. And on the other hand, the Tom space of O2 is um, P2 mod P1. Okay, so what, what is this equation in this case? It says that um, it's a relation between the smash product of pointed P1 with itself and P2 mod P1. Now, these things are not the same, um, but the way they become equivalent in motivic spectra is using this uh, smooth blow-up excision condition so there's a zigzag between these two things. Um, there's some scheme B, and B is the blow up uh, of P1 times P1 in one point, which is the same as the blow up of P2 in two points. Yeah, so this B is a common blow up of both sides, yeah. And then there's also a boundary divisor on this, which, is, which has three components. So it's an H, it's a figure H in this thing. Uh, and such that, um, yeah, both of these maps uh, become um, isomorphism after imposing smooth blow up excision. So. Uh, yeah, so this is roughly how this goes, yeah, and uh, yeah, if I have some time near the end, I will say even more about this, uh, because I think this is 
I mean, this is a very basic example, but to understand how this works in general is also pretty interesting. Oh, it's just some divisor which you have to define on B, but I mean, it's going to be the pre image of P1 along this. Yeah, it's a pre image of P1 here. So it's a union of the two exceptional divisors over these two points and uh, the strict transform of this divisor. No, like this. Like this. Okay, but let me try to explain the idea behind the proof of P1 homotopy invariance. As I mentioned, these three conditions imply P1 homotopy invariance and more generally this uh, projective bundle homotopy invariance. Well, I guess I will only yeah. I will actually only do the case of P1. So it's a, it's a baby case. Let's prove P1 homotopy invariance. Uh, so this is now the statement that um, if you have two points in P1, so let's say 0 and 1, um, <coughs> Yeah, these are um, homotopic. Maybe I should add this one base point. Yeah, so yeah, con considering those as unpointed objects, in other words, they become homotopic in motivic spectra. As a statement, uh, yeah. So of course, in A1 homotopy theory, there's nothing to prove. Um, so the key idea here is um, use the fact that the uh, automorphism group of a tensor invertible object is abelian. This is always true, yeah. It's always true. Um, yeah, actually, I'm not going to explain. I'm only going to explain a weak form of this, which is the statement that um, actually, if I go to the Tom space, which is pointed P1, yeah, then these two composites are homotopic to one another. I mean, in this case, it's easy to deduce this statement from this one um, using the fact that this P1 splits as, as a copy of uh, this plus this, yeah, using stability. Um, but uh, this argument does not work to, to prove the general case of a higher dimensional sheaf. Yeah, so here you have to uh, work a little bit more. Mm, okay. So, um, so the idea, so... So this object is now invertible in uh, motivic spectra by definition. And um, there is uh, an automorphism of P1 uh, which uh, exchanges 0 and 1 yeah, and fixes infinity. So which is given by this matrix. Yeah, so I send x, y to uh, x plus y, y. So that's an automorphism of P1, which sends, um, well, it doesn't exchange, but it sends 0 to 1, and it sends infinity to infinity. 
So it suffices to show that this automorphism is homotopic to the identity. Well, if you want to consider the, the automorphism uh, anima, it's going to be an infinity group. Yeah. Oh, you just look at infinity. Yeah, yeah. This is always going to be an infinity group if you're a tensor invertible object in a symmetric monoidal infinity category. Okay, yeah. And here you are looking at. So here, this is just an automorphism of P1 as a scheme. So, of course, this group, I'm not saying that these are abelian or anything. Okay. But, yeah. But um, yeah, in particular, now, now the claim is that this uh, self-map of P1 becomes homotopic to the identity in MSP. Yeah? And then this is really imply that these two points are homotopic, at least after going to this quotient. Yeah? Um, OK. <laughs> OK, so how can we make use of this abelianness? So abelian means that uh, any commutator is 0. and um, <laughs> it's true, no? <laughs> uh, so, uh, and of course, I mean, we know that uh, we have um, nice formulas for commutators of these elementary matrices. So here's one such formula. <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah, pretty much. OK, we have this uh, Steinberg relation between these elementary matrices. And um, yeah, uh, OK, these are now 3 by 3 matrices, whereas here I had a 2 by 2 matrix. I mean, with the 2 by 2 matrix, uh, there aren't so many interesting commutator relations. Uh, so what we do is we consider so we tensor with P1, we tensor this thing with P1 one, one more time. So we have P1 smash P1. So now there's a pointed P1s everywhere. And here we have this matrix 1101 smash identity. Yeah, so it suffices to show that this map is homotopic to the identity because P1 is invertible. Yeah, so I can check it after, after tensoring with P1. Okay, and now using this blow-up excision, I mean, using this zigzag that we had over here, I can blow up P1 times P1 in one point, and then this is a blow-up of P2 in two points. And it turns out one can fit in this diagram in the middle so that on that side we have exactly uh, this matrix here. And then there exists a map here. Everything commutes. And because of this commutator relation, and because the automorphism group of this object in motivic spectra is abelian, because it's invertible, this is the identity in motivic spectra. And then we conclude what we wanted. OK. Uh, yeah, we, we didn't use, we don't have to use infinity. We don't have to use that, <laughs> that word. Yeah, yeah it's just pi, pi naught yeah, of the automorphism groups. Um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to prove some uh, homotopy in A1 invariance. I could just exhibit uh, an explicit homotopy somewhere, right? 
Yeah. Is there a similar thing you could, in principle, do here? You could just write down some things somewhere, or is it, is it not? Well, once you have this theorem, then you can use P1 homotopy invariants to prove other things. Yeah. So this, so for example, this computation of the Grassmannian uses explicit P1 homotopies, or rather, they use these twisted P1 homotopies for non-trivial vector bundles. Yeah. So. Yeah, this is a magic ingredient, and once you have this, you can do concrete things using this projective bundle homotopy invariants. Exactly. So this uses a very special case of this wood block. Uh, and do you, do you need it more seriously in, in other ones in this time? No, not really. I mean, we, no, we only need this. But on the other hand, smooth blow up is not more general than this with the Nisnevich topology. I mean, a smooth blow up is essentially this and higher dimensional version, I mean, which we do need for the higher dimensional. Statement there. Um, okay, so let me say something about MGL. Yeah, so um, we can then define in this uh, category of metric spectra, we can define something called MGL, and we define it um, using um, This J homomorphism is it still here, yeah. So this thing from the K theory of S to motivic spectra, so it's called the J homomorphism. And we basically take the co-limit of this thing, yeah, over uh, indexed by all um, smooth S scheme X and K theory class C on X of rank zero. Um, and somehow, um, because this, this uh, functor here is symmetric monoidal, this formally implies that this is an infinity ring spectrum. So it's a commutative algebra in MSP. Uh, so MGL in A1 homotopy theory can also be defined in this way. Um, If you, if you remove the rank zero condition in this co-limit, you get PMGL. Yeah, that's a two-periodic uh, version of MGL. OK, and then uh, let me mention a few results we have about this construction. So um, first, um, MGL is the initial oriented ring spectrum. oriented commutative monoid in the homotopy category of motivic spectra. So this is a usual, uh, usual universal property of cobordism, yeah? complex cobordism, algebraic cobordism has this property. Um, and then we have, uh, then we can relate this to, to algebraic K theory and um, we can also understand it rationally. So. You have a Connor Floyd isomorphism for algebraic key theory. So let's say, I'll be more specific, let's say X is a QCQS derived scheme. Um, then we have the Connor Floyd isomorphism, MGL of X tensor over the Lazard ring with uh, Z beta plus minus one. And that recovers the The K theory of X. Uh, uh, three, so rationally. Yeah, so now let me take a, the uh, periodic version of MGL. So this is where you remove the rank zero condition in this co-limit. Uh, And so with Q, you get, uh, well, you also get uh, rational algebraic K theory, basically. Yeah. Um, OK, but rationally, you can also write it using motivic cohomology if you want. Uh, how do I want to write this? Yeah. Yeah. 
the answer with the third ring. Okay, it's just a very fancy way of saying that rationally you, you get the same information as algebraic key theory or motivic homology. I mean, there's motivic homology in this case, so this would be the non-A1 invariant. Motivic homology, uh, but of course it just filters rational key theory. I mean, it's, I mean, it's defined. I mean, we, rationally is defined in the usual way, so it's just the associated. It's just the eigenspaces, yeah. Of, uh, but there is an integral definition, yeah, which is more complicated. <laughs> this, uh, but but maybe Tom will talk about it uh, later this week. Um, ah, okay. And so there's also a SNES theorem for PMGL, yeah. So. PMGL we can write as um, suspension spectrum of BGL and then invert the bot element. Yeah, so this is now an isomorphism only uh, as, as uh, commutative monoids in the homotopy category. Yeah, this is not a, I mean, both sides are so infinity rings, but it's not an isomorphism of infinity rings. Yeah, already in topology, this fails. Um, Okay, let me just briefly say something how one proves this. So, I mean, the fact that MGL is oriented is somehow, I mean, this is a non-trivial statement. I mean, orientation means that you, you give uh, churn classes for line bundles, yes, satisfying some properties. And uh, by definition, MGL is something which has a universal theory of Tom classes, yeah, roughly speaking. And uh, you have to relate a theory of Tom classes with a theory of churn classes. And this is exactly what, uh, this point three in the previous theorem allows you to do yeah, this computation as zero is minus infinity is exactly the, what you need to show that if you have Tom classes, then you are in fact oriented. Yeah. Uh, so this is what goes into this first point here. Yeah. And then you have to compute, of course, if you have some oriented cohomology theory, you have to compute the cohomology of MGL, yeah. which there you use the fact. So then you have to compute the cohomology of these Tom spaces over BGL and you have uh, these BGLNs, and then you use the fact that it's the same as the Grassmannians, and at the Grassmannian, you can compute it uh, yeah, geometrically using projective bundle formula. Um, yeah, so this already uses kind of all of the ingredients, more or less. Um, the second one, then, this is, I mean, this is the same proof as in ordinary A1 homotopy theory. You just compare universal properties of both sides. Yeah. So right, this is now the universal multiplicatively oriented homology theory and the right-hand side also, once you know that you have this NACE theorem for, for KGL, yeah, for algebraic K theory. Uh, uh, which is like this, but here you have a pick. Yeah. If you have sigma infinity pick and invert the bot element, you get algebraic K theory, so. Um, yeah, then, then you deduce that they isomorphic, and then yeah, three and four is similar, just comparison of universal properties, basically. Uh, okay, so let me, uh, to conclude, say something more about um, the statement of this uh, symmetric monoidality of the Tom space construction. So. Yeah. Uh. I think this is where somehow most of the work in the paper is, yeah, to prove this. And it's also, I think, the, mo the most fun part of, of this thing. Yeah, so we work in a generalize what I just erased here. I mean, I explained why this was true for just uh, yeah, P1 smash P1 versus P2 mod P1. Uh, but if you want to have a symmetric monoidal functor, then you need to consider tensor product of any finite number of objects. Yeah? So the next case you would consider is uh, the, smash pro the, the smash product of three copies of P1. Yeah? Okay, so now I'm going to explain that uh, why uh, this functor like this. So now we don't need, yeah, so we have a functor from 
vector bundles or, or uh, locally free sheaves to um, pre-sheaves on smooth schemes. Uh, yeah, pointed pre-sheaves. Um, and um, yeah, so this functor by itself is not symmetric monoidal, yeah, that's why it's non-trivial. Uh, but it will become symmetric monoidal after you add, uh, after you take the Bausch localization by smooth blow-up excision. That's the claim. Okay, and just as a warm up, let's consider the case where I have three copies of P1. Uh, yeah, so there's a boundary divisor on there which gives me uh, P, uh, the, the smash product of three Tom spaces. And it should be the same as P3 modulo P2 yeah, on the other side. So we want to relate this product with P3 and um, you can do this Similar to before, there is a zigzag, but now it's more complicated. So here you need a sequence of two blow-ups on either side, yeah? and then they join up in the middle. And to understand how these blow-ups work, okay, so I attempt to... Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is what, yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, this is what I'm, I'm trying to draw, a cubical thing first, that's more difficult. Uh, okay, these are three planes, right? Hopefully one sees that, more or less. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is somehow this boundary divisor which you have on P1 times P1 times P1. Um, and uh, the sequence of two blow-ups here, uh, what you do is you first blow up the point of intersection, the origin. You blow it up and then the three, the, the three uh, axes become disjoint, yeah? And then you blow up these, the three axes, yeah? And this is, and then you, this is what these two blow-ups are. Uh, on the other hand, if you start with P3, you have to consider this uh, simplicial configuration of, hyper, of planes like this. Um, this actually lives now in, in P2 inside of P3. So this P2 is a boundary divisor on this P3. And then these two blow-ups here, you first blow up these three points here, which makes the three lines disjoint, and then you blow up these three lines. Yeah. Okay. And it turns out that uh, you get the same thing in the middle yeah, from both sides if you do this. Um, yeah, and now on this, on this blow up here, you're sort of a boundary divisor which has, now, which has now seven components. And so that when you mod out by the boundary divisors everywhere, then you get um, isomorphism in this pulse field localization. Okay. Can you remind me what is the P of the smooth estimate? This is pre sheaves. Uh, just uh, pre sheaves of uh, spaces on smooth schemes. Stars mean pointed, yeah. Pre sheaves of pointed spaces. Okay, so that's, that's kind of an X case, which you can work out explicitly, but now you really have to consider, to get symmetric monoidal thing, you have to consider an arbitrary finite family of objects here. You want to EN, and then you have to consider, you have to relate somehow the product of these uh, projective bundles with the projective bundle of the direct sums. Um, right, and so, uh, I mean, we know what we have to do. We are supposed to uh, blow up both sides, yeah, and then get some zigzag. So there is going to be something in the middle, which in the paper we call B of E1 to En. Um, and these maps are now going to be sequences of uh, N minus 1 blow-ups, yeah. smooth blow-ups. Uh, and it's, it's easy to guess, I mean, how to generalize both of these pictures to this general case, yeah. But that's, that's not difficult, so there's an obvious sequence of blow-ups which you have from that side, and there's an obvious sequence of blow-ups which you can consider from that side. 
So what it turns out to uh, surprisingly not be obvious is that once you do these blow-ups on both sides, you have to check that you get the same uh, space yeah, in the middle. And uh, this is actually somehow not obvious, at least uh, it might also be that uh, we're missing something and there is a way to make it obvious, but uh, what we use to check this is um, Oops. The following proposition, uh, which is cubical duality in stable infinity categories. So suppose K is the uh, punctured cube, so it'll be a cube of any dimension, an n cube uh, without final vertex. And C, a stable infinity category. OK, then there is an equivalence between uh, K diagrams in C and K op diagrams in C. Or this D, which works as follows. So if you have some diagram F here, you send it to DF, which is, um, yeah, so this, this, this sends some vertex K of this cube to the co limit of F um, along uh, the slice K under K. Yeah, so we, you restrict f to this uh, sub set of things on the k and take the co limit. Uh, and then the uh, functor in the other direction is the same. Yeah? So that's the functor in the other direction is g goes to d g op. op. Yeah. So you have this kind of duality for these kind of diagrams. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the, the special case when n is equal to uh, 2, this is just the fact. So, right, this, you start there with a, a diagram indexed by this shape. And then you want to get here a diagram indexed by this shape. Yeah? And this prescription says, well, you just take the push out of this diagram and you get this one. And then to go backwards, you just take the pullback of this diagram and you get back here. So, it's a generalization of this fact to higher dimensional cubes. Yeah? Uh, which uh, we could not find in the literature somehow, so I don't know. <laughs> Someone knows a reference for this, uh, that would be appreciated. But anyway, um, what does this have to do th with this problem? So, yeah, the point is, I mean, you consider these sequences of blow-ups, and I mean, every blow-up has an explicit, I mean, you can, you can write down explicitly the functor of points of these blow-ups at each stage, and then... Um, for the total row up on that side, you get some description of the functor of points, which it classifies some sort of cubes of line bundles. Yeah? And uh, if you do it from that side, the functor of points of the total row ups also classify cubes of line bundles, but they're actually not the same cubes. They're, these cubes are dual to one another according to this duality here. Um, And uh, this applied here to the stable infinity category of quasi carrier sheaves, yeah, which contains these, these kinds of things and these line models and so on. Um, yeah. So, anyway, I thought it was kind of uh, a fun fact that you have to somehow use uh, some non trivial fact about stable infinity categories to, to justify this completely elementary geometric construction. Yeah? But that's the only way uh, we know how to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, Mark is skeptical, but uh, yeah. Anyway, but uh, I think this is what I wanted to say, so I'll stop.
now like a, a track of sheep of X, but what the other sheep? Um, well, you can take any vector bundle and making rank zero by subtracting. Ah. I mean, these are like virtual vector bundles of rank zero. Yeah, so it's. And, and for the cubicle duality, uh, is this help think about anything in permission here? I mean, mm, because the reason I thought is because uh, you see we, when we, when we you consider uh, uh, CDH descent, and you consider like the George Tom and Mark Slang construction. Um, they are, they, I mean, they using some of the circle dot product by, I mean, Lex Kovac, caution by, I mean, something. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But, mm -hmm. but, but here, like this duality, uh, when I think about Hermitian things, I, I do want, I mean, I, I thought we do use it, but I, I don't know how. I mean, there is no C op which appears here, yeah? So, I mean, if you wanted to, an input for Hermitian construction, you need, uh, you need C to be identified with C op, yeah? So somehow, I don't know, this is, feels like it's a bit different. I mean, this is like a covariant duality, right? This is like for DA duality. Uh, yeah, they're different. I mean, um, well, okay, this goes into the big open questions of trying to develop some uh, for six functor formalism for a theory without a one invariant. So uh, we cannot uh, do that yet. But um, I mean, presumably. Yeah, so I'm not sure. I mean, so I don't think we, we can, I don't think we have what we need to define cohomology with compact support uh, at this point. Um, you can, of course, define it. I mean, you still have the functors which you need to define it. Okay? You can push forward on a closed immersion if you want. <laughs> but I think you cannot prove that this, is, this operation has any of the usual properties that it has. So it's not clear. That was my question about the six functor. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that seems hard. I think the thing which is most accessible at the moment is proving that smooth projectives are dualizable, mm -hmm. which has, has some nice consequences. Yeah. Like you can get non weber exact functor theorems and some other things. Um, so is, is so this projective space, is, is it very different from Boyabotsky's construction? Or? Yeah, the Boibosky's construction, this we cannot make sense of it. I mean, this uses these Juanalu devices. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, oh, so you can do this without... The fact that projective space is dualizable, that's essentially obvious, yeah, but you have the non-trivial parties identifying the dual with what you want. Um, I mean, you, you, there's a specific map, which is a specific pairing which would give the duality. Right. And uh, yeah, I think, but I think you can also prove for projective space, and then once you have for projective space, uh, it's only uh, <laughs> yeah. one more step to arbitrary smooth projective space. I see. So the dual really is the Tom space minus the tension something. Yeah, this is what one expects. Yeah. So can you construct any other classifying steps in this category, or, or just through GL? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think basically just BGLN. Yeah, I think just BGLN for now. Like uh, BSLN, for example, is already an issue. <laughs> yes. So I, so I have a question. So, so, so you, it seems to me that your theory is inherently unstable. I mean, is there any unstable analog? Um, yeah, that's a good observation. Yeah, indeed. So. Uh, 
the, I guess there are some IDs, but uh, yeah, it's not obvious if there's a reasonable unstable theory. I mean, you can ask for it to be P1 unstable and also, I mean, S1 unstable. I think both of these are difficult to remove from this construction. I just wonder whether whether you have any sort of I mean lambda structure structure of lambda really on. Uh, on the on the category something so so that the to, so that the term space is a so that the lambda structure on K theory is preserved somehow. Uh, so you mean from K theory to that uh, multiple uh, what P one. I mean, I think, yeah, so in, in topology, you wouldn't have such a structure. Uh, I, mean, I just so don't see how you, like, anywhere you, you might integrate with things like fixed polynomial functions. Where the lambda structure comes from. Uh, well, I mean, in so in E one homotopy theory, the I mean the the, th the thing which seems closely related to what you're asking are these norm functors, which you have along finite et al maps, uh, and uh, this is also somehow non-trivial to make this construction in that setting yeah, because you have to. You have to check that um, if you start, if you take the veil restriction of P1 under some finite etal maps, you get some invertible object in this category. And uh, that's a non-trivial statement. Yeah, so we don't know so if this is true or not. <laughs> Well, I expect it's also GW of K, <laughs> but I have no idea how to prove it. I mean, uh, no, no, I, I don't think we really looked at this. I mean, uh, presumably you can try to uh, define a map from GW of K into that. Well, that's maybe doable. Uh, but using suitable P1 homotopies and stuff, yeah, maybe that's possible. Um, but yeah, some other homotopy groups of the spheres, I mean, I guess there's no reason to expect the sphere to be different than the one in A1 homotopy theory because for other cohomology theories, which we know, like K theory and motivic cohomology, I mean, over field, they are A1 invariant. So this could also be true for the sphere. Um, and that would definitely simplify things, so <laughs> it would be nice if it were true.